Good evening, and uh, I don't know if happy, well, Humanitarian Day is quite the right way to frame it, but it's an important day that we are marking with an incredible, I know it will be an incredible conversation between two very special filmmakers and about a very big and important topic, Syria. Uh, so we are today spotlighting the film Ayuni by Yasmin Feda, who's an award-winning filmmaker who spent six years making this extraordinary work. And she will be joined in conversation with Wad al khatib who made the incredible BAFTA-winning Oscar-nominated for Sama. And so we, I will welcome them shortly. Um, first of all, I will just tell you a little bit about Bird's Eye View and Reclaim the Frame and what we do. And uh, we are a mission bringing ever greater audiences to films by women. For us, it's about who tells the story. So our, we mark our um, all of our events with Reclaim the Frame, which you can see in the corner of your frame there. Um, and that is about the, the perspective and saying that who tells the story is important, who guides to what we see and don't see within the frame is who holds the power. And there are extraordinary perspectives that have been sidelined or silenced for since the history of cinema, since the start of cinema. And those are lots of um, minority voices and women are not minority, but they have been made to be the minority within cinema. And for us, it's incredibly important to, to change that and to flip the script. So we do this work across the country. What's been incredible during COVID-19 is obviously the cinemas that we normally work in are closed. So we have been doing all our work online like tonight. And that means that we can unite not just across audiences across the country and the cinemas uh, that we work with, but also we can talk to people internationally too. So I'm welcoming everyone from the UK and, and anyone who's joining us internationally too. Uh, and I would just like to say, if you are interested in what we do, you can join the movement, you are powerful, uh, you can make a difference. So this is about conscious consumerism. This is about saying that actually, if you care about equality, you can also make a difference by choosing to see films that are written by women or directed by women or based on a story or book or by a woman, and you can make a difference. And what we will do is spotlight those films for you. So it's about curation, but it's also about cultural activism. And if you sign up to Reclaim the Frame, you can get a free ticket to our events, which will start up again soon in cinemas around the country. Um, but also to see films like Ayuni online. Um, without further ado, I would all like to welcome our special guests. Please join me, uh, Yasmin Fida and Wild Al Khatib. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi, everyone. Wonderful to see you both. Um, so I would like to kick off. So just to, so the audience know, we will talk for a little while. Um, we will talk together. This will be a conversation. And then you are open to ask questions at any point. Please um, put them in the comment stream and we will come back to those soon. Um, so before I, um, we actually get into the conversation around Ayuni, um, I would like both of you actually to say, to talk, a, how would you like, what would you like the audience to know about you that they may not know already? I think self-introductions are kind of nice. So Yasmin, let's start with you. What would you like the audience to know before? Yeah. Thanks, Mia, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. It's really great to be part of this conversation. Um, I suppose I'm a filmmaker. I've been making films for about 15 years. Um, and Syria, um, I'm not from Syria, but I have a lot of family in Syria. I'm very close to Syria. It's somewhere I've lived. Um, and it's basically the place I started making films and continue to make films on or about. Um, and so my interests really have always been about trying to find ways to get people to connect with stories from different places. And this is kind of the starting point. Um, yeah, that's kind of where I'd like you to know that I have a, a real connection to this place. And this is what, what has pushed me to make a film like a union others that I've made. Wonderful. And Wad? Hello, everyone. Yeah. And I'm very glad really to be uh, with you, Maya, again, and with Yasmin. I'm, I'm very like, I, I'm proud of this new film too, and for everything you even you've done before. Um, my name is Wad Al Khatib. I'm Syrian, and uh, I live today in the UK. Um, 
I started filming um, as a citizen journalist and uh, I was a student at Aleppo University when the Syrian revolution started. And with the um, next uh, five years, I was documenting my personal life as well as the events that was happening in Syria. Uh, I made uh, my first documentary um, as a long documentary for Sama. And now I'm uh, working at Channel 4 News, um, trying to bring stories also from Syria and from all over the world. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so let's start by talking about um, the journey to making Uni, Yasmin. It's taken six years and talk to us about how, yeah, how it all started and how you found these connections. Yeah, um, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Although I was working on it over six years, it actually started um, as a different film in 2013, I was uh, I reached out to a priest I knew, Father Paolo Dall'Olio, the Italian Jesuit who's in the film, and he uh, was someone I'd made a few films with his community in Syria in the past. And um, as the revolution started, he got quite involved. He was quite vocal, and you know, he, it, this eventually led to his expulsion from this from the country. And he'd lived there for over 30 years. And when that happened, he started um, traveling to lots of areas, kind of advocating for for change, for democracy, um, for awareness also about what was happening in Syria. And he even started a TV talk show, which uh, we feature a little bit in the film. And I thought this was really, really interesting ground to kind of make a new film with him. So I reached out, we met once again, kind of to start this new project together. And then a couple of months later, he'd smuggled himself into Raqqa to, to negotiate the release of um, kidnapped journalists. And at that point, he was kidnapped and never heard from since, not until today either, unfortunately. But that, that was the point that sort of got me to really start to understand with time what disappearance means. Um, at that point, I'd heard a little bit that it was happening, but I didn't really understand how much. Um, and really, it was Paolo's journey that opened that up. It was something that regime forces were doing to a lot of people. I mean, today it's at least 100,000 people who've been disappeared, um, and then by other non-state armed groups. And it was the process of actually trying to emotionally, personally, all these things, grapple with this like strange reality of like, what do you do? What how do you feel when someone's disappeared? It led me to Paolo's family, and through that process, it led me to other people I knew who had known someone who has disappeared. Um, the other person in the film, featured in the film, is Basil Khartabil Safadi. And I knew him as well in Damascus. And he set up the first hack lab. He was friends with lots of my friends. And actually, he was in prison for several years. And his wife, Noura, who's in the film, visited him over a period of three years. And it was in 2015, he was taken from his cell and disappeared. And so I connected with her sort of after that point. And it, I kind of found like, I didn't plan to make this film and maybe this is something why I'd felt it sort of happened, <laughs> you know, and you sometimes when a film happens to you, you kind of have to go to where it takes you because you can't not do it. You know, I can't not tell the story of Paolo and Basil and Nora and Mackie, Paolo's sister. Um, so that's really where it started. But interestingly, there's footage in the film that's from the very first film I made, which was in Syria in 2004 with Father Paolo. Um, one of the early scenes with him is, is actually quite old, you know. Um, so it kind of spans a whole period of time till we get to where we are today. Mm -hmm. And while you saw the film a few weeks ago, so what would you like to share about Ayuni? I, I mean, like, I really don't know, but, like the main thing that I'm very happy that this film has existed and it's happened. Uh, like this is for us as Syrians, it's something very important just to save the story, to save the history, uh, to say what has really happened, what the truth about this amazing people. Like Father Paolo for us was something as, um, you know, like a, a hero in a cartoon, even before he was kidnapped for us was like, he was very well, very well known and like, is really like a hero. And then when he was kidnapped too, it it was something like make us all feel that we are losing our people. We're losing the hope that we have. And then Basil, I don't know him. I've never met him before, but also I heard a lot about him um, and on social media about Noura and him and their story. So it was just very, um, I mean, 
it's very hard to breaking, but at the same time, I was so happy that I'm watching something where I can see them and know who are these people. Um, uh, to see also all this footage from Basel before and also from Apollo. And uh, as Yasmin just mentioned, like even very early days, I mean, it just like, I was so happy and also so sad at the same time because we lost these people. We lost um, that hope that, you know, like one day mm. there's people like Father Paolo and like uh, Basel, but also at the same time, like we should not lose this hope because we have people like Nora and like uh, Father Paolo uh, uh, sister. So it's mixed between really so much feeling, but really thank you Yasmin for making this. And I know like how like thousands of stories should be even told like, and we have so much responsibility, all of us. So I really hope to continue making this kind of films and just like so many stories should be told. Yeah, and it's interesting you say, cause I mean, Paolo and Basel had almost become symbols, you know? Yeah, they are, yeah, they are. Yeah. Paolo particularly was a larger than life character. I mean, even physically, when you're in a space with him, he's there, <laughs> you know, you couldn't like not um, feel his presence, you know, um, but he became a symbol as a Basel. And I thought, you know, that's really important and hopeful and what they stood for was really hopeful, but it was really important for me to also just share that really personal story, you know, and the fact that I found myself having footage, probably like when you were making your film, you're like, what do I have? You know, what's in here? Like. I had footage of Paolo that spanned more than more than 10 years, you know. Um, I had access to Basil's own footage, footage his friends had filmed, and that kind of put me in a position to realize that I needed to do something with this. This is really special, you know, this footage. It's no longer just like archive, it's actually something that makes people feel alive in the present, you know, and, and I had a responsibility to do something with it. And yeah, so it was really- You did it, and you did it amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Ad. No, thank you. Can I pick up on what Wad just said, actually, about the kind of response, the sense of responsibility? Mm. I mean, that, I mean, one has that as a filmmaker yeah. anyway, whatever story you're telling. But this, I mean, they're just, it's, it's huge, the responsibility that both of your, you are carrying in various ways. So can you just talk a bit more? Let's get into that a bit more, because I think there's like, what does it mean to you? And, how do you how do you carry it? Because it's big. What? Let's start with you. Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, it's absolutely too like too big. Even like it's bigger than anyone could even carry. But this is like the like we really as Syrian people and also like so many other countries in the region. Like we lost everything. We lost our uh, like present. We lost even like sometimes fe the feeling of the future. The only thing we have is these memories and these stories, which we carry everyone like of us. And every time we start to forget something or not to feel something toward our issues or our life, it's we feel like part of us being killed. And I think that's why it's very, very important, this kind of films and so many other films, which we didn't do yet, but we should all do, is because this is what we are saving from uh, like, our, us from being existed. What we have now is the Russian and the Syrian regime are taking all this propaganda, trying to dismiss and uh, like just make these people sometimes unreal and sometimes making uh, so many bad stories about them. And uh, just like, you know, this is the only way for us to save this and to keep what happened in Syria, what happened in most of the countries, uh, uh, like in, in our region, uh, this is just like this kind of stories. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, as filmmakers, really our responsibility is to find ways to personalize stories because I think people sometimes, like there's so much happening that it's sometimes hard to find the way in, to find the way to connect. And I think as filmmakers, our responsibility, one is the thing about representation. You know, I want to represent Paolo as he was. He was complex, he was complicated, he was larger than life. You know, people loved him, but people hated him. I mean, I don't talk so much about that, but you can just see his presence was a big presence. And I think it's really important to sort of populate and animate people as fully as you can, as fully as film allows you. You can't do everything in film, but there's a lot you can do. And I think we, we have to try and do that. Yeah, I mean, I just want to like continue on Yasmin because 
what Yasmin did in this film, like she brought Father Paolo and Basil again to life. And it's not just about them as two people, but it's about like thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people who've been like just forgotten, even like some people who we know, our friends, our family, and just to present these two people as they are. We are not just creating any story. This is the story that people try to ignore and we need just to put it as it is. Uh, and I, I think that's the least we can do. And as a responsibility, uh, yeah, we have like so much responsibility, but it's not just, of course, it's as a filmmakers. And I think any filmmaker has that responsibility toward the story that they are due. But in a place like Syria, this is a need. This is something, I mean, just part of the justice that we, yeah. we will gain. And we think maybe will not, but this kind of films who brought this justice. To our life. Hope so. And Yasmin, mm. what what impact has it had on on the people that you particularly center? I mean, I'm thinking Nora and and Mashi, the sister. And you know what? Yeah, what's that like? Again, that's another responsibility. You're you're processing your their grief, their uncertainty. I mean, that's a lot as well, isn't it? But was yeah. it cathartic? Talk us through that. Yeah, it's an interesting process. And I think filmmaking kind of puts you in these unexpected places. I mean, the first time I met Maki was actually, um, I, I didn't realize I was going to meet her. I was actually in Iraq in Kurdistan um, for another project. And there's a small com community that was connected with Paolo and where he stayed before he went to Syria the last time. And I'd, this was less than a year after his kidnap. And I went to visit to connect and just kind of see where he'd been the last time really he was living and and just to get a sense of how people were processing it and, and things like that. And by chance, one of the monks was like, oh, his sister's coming in a few days. So I decided to extend my trip um, to meet her. And so we met and we got on and I, I did an interview with her that time, which isn't in the film, but um, she'd asked me like a year later to, to send her a copy of the interview, which I did and she, it was interesting. She was like, that was the first time someone actually just sat me down and asked me how I felt, <laughs> you know, because the whole time since he was disappeared, it was just like trying to just deal with the situation. It was like very much about like the immediate, you know, and she'd never kind of sat back to talk to someone about it. And it was interesting on that level. I wasn't expecting that cathartic thing kind of from, from the process of filmmaking. And I think film can create these spaces for that to happen. and. You know, and that continued and also just the emotional reality changed over time and we kept filming and meeting and, you know, there was a new layer, there was a new development. Um, I don't mean in Paolo's story, but sort of emotional development. So it was interesting to sort of film through that. And the same with Nora, actually. Um, I mean, Nora is amazing. Uh, she's amazing anyway, and she was amazingly open with me. You know, the, the, the main interview I filmed with her, I met the first time I met her you know, and she just really opened up and trusted me, you know, and when that happened, I realized, okay, you know, I really should give this justice and see it through, you know, um, and she let me kind of keep checking in with her, keep filming with her through this really difficult process, because you kind of grieve and you kind of can't, you know, it's a very difficult emotional space. Um, so yeah, and then for me, I guess, the making of a film is a way to deal with this really difficult situation. Like, how can I deal with, I mean, I can't do anything, <laughs> you know, I can't like find where they are, you know, but, but the making of the film is a way to sort of also help me process what I think about this and create something that I hope other people can use to do that, you know. Well, you've talked similarly actually about, it was one of the things that you just knew the, the one thing you could felt you could do in order to make sense of things. So just, yeah, can you pick up on what Yasmin was just talking about there about just, yeah, having a purpose that may be a focus and, and that is your own way to create some sense of catharsis? Just, yeah, pick that line up. Yeah, I think this is like briefly the, the importance of, uh, or the belief of the importance of what we were, what we are doing or what we were doing even before. I think that's the feeling when I was like, when I felt that I um, like trapped with this place in Aleppo under the siege and I don't know what will happen next. I don't know if I will be even alive in the next like minute or not. 
And the only thing I have is this camera and everything I'm going through now, like being pregnant, being a mom and having my first child and all of this like amazing feeling where I know that this is like, I could lo lose all of this at, at any second. And filming this is something make me feel that no, I'm strong. No, even if I was, if I would be killed like after five minutes, but I saved that moment. I I make it like something forever while I could be like just a kid or not, not exist anymore. And I think that also was the challenge that I faced after that was when I found out that I'm survived now and I have all of this archive. I need now find a way to stand again and just like think how I can make it. I think this is also something that we just mentioned about like, yeah, you can't just escape. You can't just ignore. You have all of this archive and this film and you have that responsibility now. And in Forsama, that was the thing that make me just like, I don't know how this film will be. I don't know where it will go to. I don't know like, what is it even about? But I know that I have all of this footage. I'm now stuck in this. I need to make it anyway. And that's how it's, it's been done. What's also interesting about both films, I feel, is that you both sort of found literary forms that actually add something really powerful. I mean, Ward in yours, it's your letter. And and then Yasmin, it's in it's the poetry. I mean, the, what, particularly like one example, if the world was square, we'd lie low in a corner whenever the war plays hide and seek. Yeah, I mean, some extraordinary moment. I mean, that, yeah, there's something very, very powerful about what that adds. And it's very cinematic. Both of those really bring a sense of cinema. So Yasmin, how did you, where did that come from? Where Where did the idea for the poetry come in? Um, yeah, it's interesting. The film and creative process, I, when we were editing the film, we were, I mean, I was really conscious that I wanted to find um, something like a, a, a way for audiences to step back a little bit and just take it in to, to help the film move, to create another layer that's kind of alongside the actuality, let's say. Um, and that took so many different forms <laughs> through the edit. You know, there was a form that was actually about making things. There was something about artifacts, you know, and we tried so many different things. And in the end, actually, the thing that really resonated was this poetry by Dunya Mikhail, who's an Iraqi poet uh, based in the US. Um, I was just reading through her poetry and I just, they're really short to the point poems that just spoke so much. And when we were editing um, and the editor I was working with at the time just found the right place to put them in, they just totally worked. And But it's interesting because it wasn't something that, you know, we found in the beginning, it was actually something we kind of figured out much further down the process, but it just sort of gelled for us, you know. And what I love about her poetry is it, it just says it, it just sort of lifts you out a little bit, you know, but says it in, in a very visual language as well that I think, or I hope people can really relate to. So yeah, that was it. And it just sort of punctuated certain emotional points in the film and it was really important to find that um i guess vehicle for me in the film mm -hmm. well that's true uh for you too the letter came much later so you can relate to that point yeah exactly like when uh, we we worked on the film for around like two years me and edward my co-director edward watts and we when we started like as I just mentioned, we had no idea about where to start, what is the film even about. And with over 500 hours, so much ideas, so much like uh, like lines which I followed or people I uh, filmed for years. And then like we were just trying to find out what is the heart of this film. And for Sama, and Sama was like literally in every clip and in every idea and every thoughts, but it wasn't even clear for us until like uh, two third uh, through the process of making the film. So literally after like one year and eight months when we were like set back and we were looking about, yeah, it's summer everywhere. So it's all for summer. And even before summer was born, this film and this revolution and this uh, uh, like amazing feeling of uh, um, like change was for summer for 
all the Syrian children for the future, for the hope, which was all presented in Sama as a just little child. And for this, we felt that that's how the film should be. Um, and it was like, as Yasmin just mentioned, or maybe like a little bit different, it was very easy for us. We were just like back, it's about for Sama, and we saw how it all like worked very, very uh, like smoothly with, with this idea. Uh, and now even like, I was almost thinking about if I want to change something in the film or if I want to do like a different idea, it will never be worked as it is now with For Sama. So yeah, the same exactly. So what, um, also can we pick up on, um, I mean, you're further ahead obviously because For Sama has been out and had just, I mean, an unimaginable impact. I mean, you could never have predicted, and it was such an honor to tour this film with you. And, you know, just being in screenings after screening after screening with people just, just devastated and feeling incredibly driven to do something, you know, the power of cinema. I mean, could you ever, what's it like to reflect on that now? Because it's just been a mad year for you. You know, yeah. how does it? It's still going on, isn't it? Yeah. This is like your. This is This is just your life now. But yeah. talk to yeah. us about what it feels like to reflect on it, having had a little bit of distance. So actually, when we were working on the film, and because my very, I mean, shocking and personal experience when I was in Aleppo and when I just like left, um, of feeling, you know, so much like hope and like strength that we can do something we can change something and then like we were kind of disappointed by the un and most of the countries who they were just watching what happened and then like the only option they have for us was just to force us to leave so i kind of like lost that faith that we can really change something and i wanted just to make the story because yeah i mean that's the only thing i can do now and this is what could even bring justice to our story, to Aleppo and to what, toward what happened. But I've never thought that this film could take something for in the future for other people or people could even like be interested to come and to watch. And we've been told this a lot for two years when we were, while we were working on the film. And literally I heard this sentence like, I don't know how many times, like no one will come to watch another Syrian film. And I was kind of like, yeah, I'm I'm fine with this. I just want to do it because I have to do it. And then uh, when the film started to be like out and I saw how many people just wanted to watch and wanted to know more about Syria, but not just that, but also they wanted to do something. And this amazing question, which we had in every screening, when someone like just stood up and said, like, what can we do? Um, I mean, that's what really gave me hope and gave me faith that, yeah, maybe like I was a little bit in rush when I said like, no, no, this is really a big hope and a big opportunity for people to be interact and to do something. And just like the amazing of this, even like now after like one year and uh, five, six months, one year and a half since the film was out for the first time and we still have like, events every day we have still releases in so many countries so that's just like show you how people are really care and we need to provide them with these tools for them to feel that they understand they know and they want to do something and yasmin you're much newer your film's just coming out so but and what impact yeah what 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 work do you want to do with the film now yeah. Um, I mean, it's kind of interesting time to be releasing a film. <laughs> we released it uh, at the beginning of July and we uh, ended up self-releasing it with support from uh, the Syria campaign at Amnesty International um, UK. And the reason we did that actually is it had its premiere in March uh, at CPH Docs, uh, which ended up going digital. It was supposed to be an in-person festival, but obviously lockdown started happening everywhere. And, you know, I don't want to sound cynical, but like as an independent filmmaker without that much support, it was like, what are we going to do? You know, do we wait? Do we wait the storm or do we actually ride the storm? <laughs> you know, and trying to figure out what the best thing to do is. And we realized, actually, let's just take it into our own hands and release it because 
this is what we can do right now and try and build up interest, you know. So it's been out in the world for like a month and a half and considering the situation, I think it's been going well. <laughs> um, you know, we've had good views here in the UK and in other countries, we've had several events happening. Um, it's released in Italy for a month on a cinema platform um, and we're slowly building it up. I mean, I would, we're, and we're hoping, I mean, this is where it's hard to know what will come next. We're hoping to do in-person events particularly to Syrian families. I mean, ideally we wanted to do things in Lebanon, but obviously we have to see how that pans out now that the situation's become even worse there. Um, in Turkey, in Jordan, you know, but we still need to figure out kind of what that will look like. Um, so it's the early days, but I hope, you know, that it will have a good journey, inspired by For Summer, you know. I'm actually curious to ask Wa'ed as well, like how impact and screenings have been working for you in lockdown, like what they've looked like and kind of how it's been working. It's it's quite interesting just to hear from other filmmakers. Yeah, I mean, uh, first, like really, um, I don't know what how to say this or what to say even like, but yeah, I, I'm sure like the lockdown is make everything much harder. And I'm sure if that the film was released, not in this situation, it will be like totally different. But I think, yeah, I mean, for the first of the lockdown, I kind of was like a little bit happy that yeah maybe now it will be all like off quite nice and last year was really like mad and everything and I just wanted like I felt I I might not be able even to be um, interacting right with the film after like all of this and they wanted a little bit time as off or something but then it seems like <laughs> the COVID-19 and the online digital platforms and everything like you you are able to be in three four places at the same time where you are at home which is amazing and like i think just like this is a new opportunity for us to reach places we could never reach when we had like just we we, we need to travel or to do some stuff but i think everything has like positive and negative things um i'm quite exhausted now <laughs> but still like happy of course that there's an amazing people who wants always to share the film and to talk about it. So we have our release in Denmark um, in September and I'm going there to attend one screening. But also, you know, things just changed a lot. But I'm sure like, I hope really this, like you can be useful as much as you can from this online digital now and make maybe like 10 screening at the same day where you are just in your pyjama, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. So I wanted to talk um, before we actually catch up on the situation in Syria now and and to spotlight yeah to the audience to catch people up because obviously COVID-19 has taken over world news for far too long and it feels like some really big important things have fallen off the agenda um, Syria being one um, but before we come back to that um, I just wanted to ask a bit about how you deal with trauma I mean both of you like yeah I mean Yasmin you're kind of documenting it but you're also experiencing it because you knew one of your protagonists I mean Wad you know you're you know it's been a whirlwind for you but each time you're talking about this stuff even now you're being re-traumatized you know it's like it's this is a lot you know when you're taking on a subject that it is this raw and this prescient and this current and so could you just both talk a little, whatever you would like to share around that, like self-care, how you start to process, I mean, while you've got a family processing trauma. So it's a lot. And I feel like it's particularly important now because everyone's been through a traumatic experience in COVID in some way. Some people extremely because they've lost someone you know, it's nowhere near like a war, but it's still trauma. And I feel like more people can empathize than ever. So can you both speak to that? Yasmin, maybe let's pick up with you first. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, it's something we mentioned before. I think the making, the feeling like you're being active and doing something is very helpful um, way of dealing with kind of emotional trauma. But I think also, 
figuring out what where your boundaries are and actually taking a break. Like I'm someone who needs a break. I'm someone who likes to swim. This is just totally on a personal thing. That's what makes me feel chilled out and ready to deal with anything, you know? So to feel physically fit and in water, for example, and actually anyone living in London, there's a reservoir open now that you can swim in <laughs> and that's changed my life. You know, that, that kind of thing makes a lot of difference. And I also have a daughter that's about the same age as some actually. The first time we met, we kind of realized um, and just, also making sure you have time for that, you know, because I think it's it's a juggling act, you know, a filmmaking career as a freelancer, an independent filmmaker, trying to make a living, you know, trying to work on important subjects, but also taking care of yourself in whatever way that is, you know, even if it's very light, you know, like a swim or enjoying an ice cream. But I think those are the kinds of things that you should really take care of. And what? I uh, I don't know yet. I mean, this is something I'm very glad to hear what Yasmin said. So I might like get inspired by what you are doing. Uh, but I I don't know really yet. Still, like, I mean, we talked a lot in public and in so much places where you could feel like you are kind of not just like putting this to yourself, but at the same time, I mean, this journey just make everything like, you have some hope because of the film spread out and everything is good but also it's very like exhausting and very upside down with your feeling with your expectation with your hope and as much as you were trying to control even like your hope and your expectation but you can't always do that and maybe in every meeting we walk in or walk out we expect something and then it not happened and sometimes you even like try to put yourself in jail like I don't want to like expect anything better but then even sometimes you feel like very desperate or disappointed by something where it's just normal I think the main thing is more we need just like time to process this we need kind of help sometimes but I think we are just this is something also like I think Yasmin could share with me but like the guilt that we feel so far about all the other things that we weren't able to do or that we can't even like do now it's something we feel like we are even shy to express this out because what we are living in now it's privilege if you want to compare it to any other syrians who can just like be in our place so i think this is something it's bad but it's kind of the reality that we are facing all so i think we are just like fine we are better than so many people and we should be like better also soon. Yeah, I, just to add, I think, I mean, I didn't experience the same level of trauma. I wasn't in Aleppo when it was under siege, you know, um, and I wasn't in Syria when I made this film. It's a different relationship, but I think, you know. But you have like, uh, I don't know, 100,000 years of trauma, like the same, like, yeah. Same yeah, yeah. I mean, my family's Palestinian. I grew up with all of that. You know, like I, I, I get it. But I think, I don't know. I think it's also just really important to, like, when you feel strong enough to just recognize, okay, this is where I am now. So what is the best I can do with that? Um, and to try and give from there, you know, because what you're doing is giving to people by making a film, by showing awareness, you know, so many people who can't do that will appreciate that that is happening, you know, and I think it's really important to try and just um, take strength and solidarity, I guess, because that's also really important. Um, but, you know, it's a long process and it's really difficult at times. And can I ask Yasmin also about Nora and uh, Mecca? Mecca? Uh, I'm Mac sorry if I. Mecca. Yeah. 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 Uh, and their like participation in the film now, and they're also like. Yeah. Like, I'm sure they living with this trauma also. So what they, after they've seen the film like full and everything, what they, what they told you, what was their like feeling? Yeah, I mean, it's always nerve wracking showing a film to people you've made, it's a, a film to people you've made it with um, for the first time. And thankfully both Nora and Mackie really loved it and really connected with it um, and felt really comfortable to have it out in the world. And we've actually, you know, in some of the events we've done in the last month, they've taken part in some um, events. So we've sort of, 
virtually managed to be in the same place together, which was actually really nice to be able to share that. Um, and uh, Nora is like an incredible person. She's a human rights lawyer. She advocates for political prisoners. She supports families of those disappeared and detained, um, mostly in Lebanon at the moment through her organization, No Photo Zone. Um, but, you know, the film is, and she's part of this movement, Families for Freedom, actually, which is featured a little bit in the film with the London bus um, and the images of those disappeared. And, you know, I'm always in awe at how she keeps going and has so much energy for so many people. But I think, you know, one thing she says and that I really recognize in her is that, you know, she's like, okay, I've found myself having this platform, so I have to do something with it. You know, I have to talk about all the others, you know, um, all the stories that aren't as well known, that aren't being talked about. Um, so this film is one way to do that, but it's also a personal one. You know, she shared so much of her own <laughs> intimate life, you know, and that's really, really difficult, but she was so open. And I think that was really incredible. And Mackie, you know, Paolo's story is very well known in Italy. Um, actually, the anniversary of his disappearance was July 29th. So there was a lot of events and media sort of around that in Italy. So Maki, every year, you know, wants to talk about Paolo, um, how much, li how little information they have. Um, but I think for her this year, it was nice to have a film to talk about it, like a personal way, because I think it's quite easy to just talk about it sort of as a, as a news piece or as a, um, a political thing, and I think she was happy to talk about it through this very personal way. Um. So, can you catch us up on on what's the situation in Syria now? Wad, can we start with you? Yeah. So, uh, I it's very hard really to like brief you yep. in in a couple of minutes, but like the main thing that's happening now. And I'm talking specifically about Idlib area and uh, the northwest, where uh, the people who were in Aleppo, for example, fled to the people who came from uh, Ghouta, the Damascus countryside also, um, and the people who are already living in this area uh, in Idlib, where Corona now just started to have like cases. And um, like, unfortunately, yesterday, uh, Al-Quds Hospital, the hospital that uh, started also in Idlib after uh, the staff fled from uh, Aleppo to Idlib, the same hospital that most of the For Summer film was like happening in. Uh, they just like um, uh, closed yesterday uh, because they, the first case of coronavirus was uh, dead. So it's so much like stress and mm -hmm. um, it's so hard because the area already like uh, mm -hmm. full of uh, problems and they have so much like... Uh, um, challenging to do to deal with in case like not just like the health system but everything and uh, this area has so much camps and people like who lives in like not very good conditions and that's all make it like even much much harder um, also on the other side where the regime uh, side and um, also like people just suffering from COVID-19 in very high level of numbers and the government is not reporting this as it is. And uh, like, it's just like, they accuse people if they said we have coronavirus and they might be arrested for this. So the situation is just like became worse and worse. Um, I just like really unbelievable. Also like the area where uh, in Raqqa and where Qasad now is controlling like uh, North East also like, so many families, they were waiting for news for their, like, beloved ones who've been disappeared. Um, like, and no one knows anything. Like, all these uh, uh, graves that they found with unknown names and unknown people, bodies, like, it's not enough, like, putting in that place to know more about where are these people, what happened to them. And just people are hunger just to know something and... To do something and we have even like no access to that area to to know to ask for for these people unfortunately yeah just to add as well that um i mean the issue of covid19 and uh the detained and the disappeared uh you know it's really there's there's calls to release political prisoners because the you know the the situations that they're kept in are really really dire you know they're very 
I mean, people are poorly anyway, <laughs> that kind of prison system and to add uh, a deadly virus potentially is really dangerous. So, I mean, the Syria campaign have a petition about this actually, which we can share. Um, but also just to pick up what Wad was saying, the fact that it's so difficult to get information and particularly um, in the areas around Raqqa and the families and the mass graves, like, you know, um, there's a, a young man, Amr, in the film whose brother was um, uh, kidnapped and disappeared by Daesh uh, from Raqqa. And the way he describes it is that you, you know, there's not even, there's nowhere you can go and get information. Nobody knows if it's, if it's being investigated, being documented correctly. Like, it's a really, it's kind of a black hole of information. And if that stuff isn't documented well, it might be really difficult to gather the information for basic thing, the right to know, but secondly, eventually for accountability and justice connected to disappearances. I mean, there's several questions coming through about what what action can can audiences take? I mean, you both have campaigns connected to your film. Wad, can we maybe start with action for Sama? What, where are you at now? What are you spotlighting and, and how can people, what can people do? You're on mute. Sorry. Uh, so I really would love people to look at the website, actionforsama.com, and see the tools that we provided for people to be connected and to be involved in this. Uh, our main like thing that we are working on now is the accountability. And we are building a law case against the regime and Russia about attacking hospitals, specifically from the point uh, where it was in the film about the CCTV footage and uh, the people who were witnessing and uh, they even like lost their lives in that attack and we hope like for this case to to be uh, ready and then also like to do follow-up pieces uh, with other hospitals and other people who've been like killed in um, like at least like in bombing hospitals where we should just all agree on that something should be a red line. Uh, but also, I want to mention something uh, Yasmin also could share with me about the importance of have partners and amazing supporters in these campaigns, uh, where in our both case, the Syria campaign was like an amazing supporter in for Sama and to work with us through the, the whole last year and even until today. And we have also like help refugees and uh, like an amazing people who were just trying to do everything to make the film more uh, in the attention of the people but specifically about the Syria campaign and the amazing work that they do I mean I don't know how I could survive the last year without them uh, and everything they've done like just to support the film to make people more watch it to help us also to uh, build this strategy of the any political like movement or any uh, petition or um, like events where we can meet people and uh, make people who are really like influencers and they can do something. Um, and just like I, I think as a filmmaker, our role and so many other people like agree with me in this, it's not just like to make the film out, but also how we can uh, like do something with these films. And I think with this amazing partners like the Syria campaign and the others, it, these things could make really like happen and make it like as reality, not just like as a wish or something we hope. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I think you have to find the right partners to work with and the Syria campaign are amazing. Um, and it's 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 a good partner in our, our cases because they understand strategy around yeah. Syria, like you say, and developing what, the, what, what is useful with the film around that uh, to target certain campaigns or certain, um, um, uh, like important things of importance, and uh, for us, we don't have uh, the same kind of impact campaign like for summer, uh, like action for summer. We're still in the early days, but what we are doing is um, asking people to support uh, um, the people sort of in the film. So there's, uh, it's really important to check out the work of Families for Freedom, which is a coalition, a movement of uh, Syrian women mostly um, coming together to advocate for the rights of detainees and uh, the families and their families of the disappeared. Um, and they advocate on many levels, they do different kinds of campaigns and they're just generally quite amazing. So do check out their work. Um, and secondly, No Photo Zone is an organization that Nora set up specifically to support detained, uh, the de families of the detained and the disappeared. Um, through various kinds of activities from campaigning to other kinds of support and 
uh, we are actually open to receiving to help them get donations of money if anyone was interested because they're based in Beirut and have been also affected by the recent explosion there. Um, so if you are interested in that, do reach out to us um, at info at hakawati.co.uk and we can help with that process. Yeah, and I just want to add also like for anyone who want to do anything like just to watch the film, to know more, like like Ayuni now, I think we can know where is it available after this and like just to make people know about these films and to tell other people, like if you are a journalist, like write about it or look ab about the issue that this film is talking about. If you are even like just a parent, like tell your children or find a way of explaining this, like I know, I know it's like very hard, but also very important for them to know what's happening in this world. I mean, what you are doing, Maya, and reclaim the frame and everything, like with supporting also us as female filmmakers or as our films. Also, like thank you for everything you're doing, but also like so many other people can do the same, and they can do even like to support reclaim the frame or be in like a bird's eye uh, view. Also, like this is all something we can all like do in five minutes in our day, and that will not like change our whole like life maybe but it's with all of this support together we can do something yeah I didn't link to that word. yes me yeah just to add to what i mean i think uh, as she was saying like the story of disappearance is not going to disappear you know like syria in 50 years you might be able to rebuild some buildings but if people don't know what happened it's not going to go away so it's really important to put pressure to get answers soon you know because somebody knows Somebody knows where people are. Somebody knows what's happened to them. Probably several people know, you know, and we need to get answers eventually. Um, families need to understand what happened to their loved ones. We have a question for both of you, actually. Um, maybe while we can start with you. Um, Amal Sami asks, do you have advice for independent filmmakers in terms of funding? I mean, that's hard because yours is not particularly traditional, but neither of yours are. But also the question is about funding advice, but also finding the courage to keep going. That's a big one. We sort of touched on it. Yes, hard. <laughs> really hard. But I mean, it's more like, I mean, for five years when I found whole for summer, like I had no fund at all. And I was just like trying to gather everything i'm able to do like sometimes with camera sometimes without camera and sometimes with broken mic or whatever but like i think if you are believing in this story you will find your way like to make it i know this is not like just talking and it's not that easy of course but also at the same time like if you believe in the story and you can see how you make it like you might convince one or two or three people that this is really worth it and then you can bring fund for this. I mean, it's not that easy. I'm looking for my new project. I'm sure it's not that, but I mean, just if, if like, don't look for the fund. I mean, just believe in this and try to make it happen. Even if it was like very, I mean, small or like one day you will find your way, hopefully. I know, Yasmin, it's not that easy. <laughs> Yeah, I'm going to say it. it's really tough being an independent filmmaker in the UK right now. <laughs> I find it really hard to make my living. I actually teach. I do other things to make my living, essentially. And this film, I couldn't have made if I didn't have two great producers to support me through it. We did get some funding, but it did not cover all the costs of the film. And the production companies took it upon themselves to make it happen because we all believed in it. But it's not easy. This is not to turn you off, but this is the climate we live in. You know, it's not an easy place. Yeah aren't that many funding options you know tv there aren't that many slots for documentaries like this is what it's like um so you have to be creative basically and find your allies um and carve your way like why i said if you believe in that specific topic you will find a way but there are going to be hard times and there's going to be good times you know <laughs> but um yeah you just have to grit your teeth <laughs> and, like just get the energy to do it I mean, this is why conversations like this are important. So audiences also understand their role, which is their role can be see films like this, support them, tell as many people as possible, because it's not just about the story and the very important point you made, Yasmin, that actually, you know, you're, you're documenting really crucial narratives and history that, that without your work, you and Ward and others like you, these 
these stories and and I mean your wild's film is going to become you know mass evidence of of war crimes i mean that's beyond being making a piece of cinema but going back to the original point you know audiences what you know going to see your work also helps fund films like this right so just speak a bit to that, like the, the, the responsibility that audiences or the participation audiences can have in this too. I mean, we are a microclimate, I guess, and we need to support right. each other because there aren't actually just like funding places you can just go and get money. There aren't that many. I mean, in the UK, there's one funding pot for documentary. I mean, yeah. think how many documentary filmmakers there are, you know, TV has very limited slots for the kinds of films we make, you know, so the competition is very fierce. And I think we have to think outside of that space sometimes to figure out how we can make the films. You know, there is an art film route, you know, there's one where you engage your audiences and hope that like the desire to have an independent and rich film climate, you know, is one way to support us to make films and others, you know, um, there's different ways. And I think to keep talking about these things will help us find these different kinds of solutions. And, you know, the work of Reclaim the Frame to kind of give us a platform is so important because, you know, that's the only way we can make these things happen, I think. And good luck. Oh, I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Good luck. And we really hope to support each other, all of us also as filmmakers, because that's the only way for us to know like where to go next. So, really wish the best for everyone. Um, there's a couple of questions actually about the edit. So, actually, Andrea Slater has said um, some really beautiful things about Ayuni um, in the comments. And then Art said, I can't imagine post production after six years of filming. How did you decide on what to keep and the style? Did it evolve <laughs> during six years or come together in latter stages? You sort of touched on this a bit earlier, but maybe pick up on that. Yes. Yeah. Um... I mean, it's interesting because sometimes you realize at the end that you kind of had the idea in the beginning. You didn't actually know how to express it until you got to the end. And I think in a way that's what happened here. But it was also a process of discovery. You know, I think filmmaking, the filming part, but also the editing part is really where you discover what you've got. And it's a really beautiful, amazing stage of filmmaking because it's when you get to really play with what you have. So the style did evolve quite a lot. You know, at one point, before we got to poetry, I was really interested in these archeological artifacts that were found in Syria and they have these big eyes and they're these beautiful ancient little figurines. And, you know, we kind of went through a whole storyline that was sort of around them and connecting it to the witness and all this kind of thing, but it didn't quite gel, you know, and then we tried something else and it didn't quite gel. So it was really in the end, but also having archive, I mean, receiving Basil's archive and just watching it to see what was in there and then finding him in footage that he'd filmed, you know, um, or hearing his voice, you know, we just had to listen to stuff because it's not something I filmed. So I don't have any, you know, first person memory of it. So we had to sort of dig to find those stories. And then revisiting my own archives was kind of interesting to help me figure out like what we were going to do with it. So it was, um, I mean, it was probably like, wow, we were probably editing over a two year period as well, give or take editing and then also filming, you know, at some points and editing and filming and then finally finding the shape. But what I do love with editing is when you finally hit it, you're like, that's it. <laughs> and then it's all really quick. <laughs> you know? But to get to that point takes a very long time sometimes. Well, there's a question also on, on the edit from Elvina. Um, who edited your film and did you have an active role in the edit? Well, yeah, I mean, it was your life. And, and yeah. I, that's not like editing any normal film, what you had to go through. So Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, because like none of the team have seen like the material before I came out. So I was trying to introduce everyone to this life with all of these details and starting for them to know who are these people. So first um, I sat with Ed for like around a month where we were just like were watching and talking and give him that just like understanding of the whole situation. And then uh, we had two editors, like one for like around a year and then the other year was for another one. Um, and Simon and Chloe, uh, they were just like fantastic people who were just like sitting, trying to do something. And they were between me and Edward, which was very headstrong, uh, like thoughts and ideas. And we were, they were just like between both of us, like 
trying to implement everything we were trying to do or like show us at least when even if it's not working they were trying like they know that okay this idea will not work but they were doing this and then show us that and then we can see like yeah it's not working but it's something as me mentioned it was very interesting like uh moments in the editing when you feel like and because it's all my footage so we were like for example in one idea doing something and then something come to my mind about a very like old thing i filmed but i even don't know where is it <laughs> and then like really to like uh, uh, dive in this footage to find where is this thing and i think just like the editor is playing an amazing role in this and with without every one role like we will never be reaching this moments of feeling all that we gain this film we own it and now we are all satisfied about what is it now and yeah i mean i love the editing part even in my film was something so hard in some points where i really like i wasn't able to continue anymore but also having like edward with me was something very good because i can just like step back in one second and like not be there because i just can't do anymore so i think just like the team was very helpful and just to work with people who are understand and believe also in the story is something like makes the film going to another layer yeah just to say like film is a beautifully collaborative process um i mean we're the ones here speaking but actually we're one of many you know that and we're funneling i guess their energy that that made the film happen um so we'll wrap up soon but just um first of all um what are you um doing next wad well first of all wad how how are you and hamza and sama and and your other little girl whose name i've completely forgotten i'm sorry taima no worries taima yeah we are doing well yeah i mean we are in london yeah we are in london now for our two years exactly wow so yeah i mean i can't feel that because last year was like just around yeah. so but i mean we feel just like this is the time where we need just to sit down and think about what we gonna do uh, but also it's very interesting because the kids is just like growing up very fast and sama is going to the school to school first time now this year so it's so much i mean interesting stuff happening mm -hmm. but, yeah it's good wonderful and yasmin what what next for you what are you working on um well we're uh still developing the the the, the plans for our uni and hope that we can do more through the rest of the year um and i've got a few film ideas in my head i just need to find the time to get them out and hopefully find the funding to make them you know childcare and filmmaking can happen together but uh you know we just have to figure out how and when hard <laughs> but, yeah yeah but there's an idea kind of connected to palestine that i'm really interested in um and and several others so hopefully hopefully one of something will materialize and wad what are you working on what what next you you've been doing yeah. some tv haven't you for channel 4 again recently yeah i did some reports for channel 4 news and we also like have um uh, an idea which we are developing as a documentary and it's related to syria too so also we just looking for fund and see where how this could work and um it's just interesting because it's also another like idea from outside and it's very challenging but also it's very important at the same time so i mean i hope to keep doing films and making like more and more what well, i don't think there's any doubt that you will you will keep doing that and you will keep being supported i mean for some of the extraordinary impact that you had with that movie if anyone's got any sense or if we've got anything to do with it wad you will <laughs> i hope that yeah you will um have i before we wrap up either of you got any last questions for each other or last points that you want to share yasmin let's start with you yeah um um just to say that if you know anyone's not seen the film they can see it on the film's website which is www.ayunifilm a y o u n i film.com um so please spread the word and spread the word for for summer and action for summer you know let's keep the <laughs> collaborations going 
Sure, yeah. And it's written now on the uh, oh, chat, yeah. so you can also go access to this. And very, very, very happy to see you, Yasmi. Yeah, you, you too. And thank you so much, Maya, for making this and make us together. Oh, thank, thank you. you. So it's really always an honor. And yeah, Yasmin, we will keep promoting Ayuni and we will do in-person events when we can. We'll get back way. into cinemas. The cinemas are opening up. We've been bereft. Um, but they're all starting to open up now. So yeah, um, yeah so all the cinemas that are that are listening, a lot of them are streaming on their this on their website. So oh, we great. will follow up and do something in person for sure. Yeah, and good luck, Yasmin. Like you have an amazing like tool, so I'm sure it will be all great. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. So lovely to see you both. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.